It really has been quite a few weeks since we last studied the Gospel of Luke, so I remind you that the last passage of Luke chapter 2 is what we, what, where we left off prior to Christmas, and it is centered around the 12-year-old Jesus and his parents visiting the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. And it was during this visit that Luke told us about an incident in which, unbeknownst to his parents, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem while they left to return to Nazareth. But upon learning that Jesus was not with their traveling caravan, Joseph and Mary immediately returned then to Jerusalem to look for their son. Locating him in the temple, they found him in the midst of the prominent rabbis and scholars, the professors of that day, and listening to these learned men and also asking them questions. And after hearing Jesus say to Mary that she and Joseph should not have been surprised by this, by his action, because they should have known that he had to be in his father's house, meaning the temple, his parents left with him to return to Nazareth, where we're told that he continued in subjection, submission to them. And then Luke closes chapter 2 with these very significant words in verse 52. We read, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, it would appear that Luke's purpose in telling us about this incident in Christ's life when he was 12 years old was to reveal the human nature of Jesus. And that's why this last verse of the chapter is so significant because it tells us that his human nature, not his divine nature, but his human nature needed growth, needed development, needed some time before he could begin his public ministry. And that's why Luke really tells us nothing more about our Lord's childhood or about his years as a young adult, only that he was increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men during this entire time. It's not, it's not until 18 years later, at about the age of 30, that we read that Jesus began his public ministry. Meaning what? Meaning that now, at age 30, in his human nature, he was ready, fully prepared for the work that the Father had sent him into the world to do. And we know that because of what we read in verse 23, the beginning of verse 23 of Luke chapter 3. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. However, before our Lord could begin his public ministry, something first had to happen. Something first had to take place. John the Baptist, the man that God had chosen to be the fore, <coughs> excuse me, to be the forerunner of the Messiah, he had to come on the scene. And he had to come on the scene in order to prepare the hearts of the Jewish people for the Messiah's arrival and then to introduce to them Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. And folks, that's precisely why we read in the opening section of Luke chapter 3, why we read about John the Baptist starting his public ministry, because it sets the stage for what we're going to read for the next 21 chapters in Luke, namely the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, you'll recall from previous studies in Luke that the angel Gabriel had predicted the birth and the ministry of John. This is what he said to John's father, Zacharias, chapter 1, starting in verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you'll give him the name John. You'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he'll drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient uh, to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And now, here in chapter 3, Luke is going to tell us about John fulfilling this prophecy at the start of his ministry. Now, as most of you know, John was a rather colorful, 
unique individual, perhaps we could even say a bit strange. Not only did he dress differently than others, clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt, and eat differently than others, his diet consisting of locusts and wild honey, but quite frankly, he did everything opposite what one would expect in trying to have a successful ministry. One Bible teacher I read this week outlined five things that John the Baptist did in his ministry that are completely contrary to what most Christian leaders are trained to do these days in trying to build a ministry. Here's what this Bible teacher said about John's, John's unorthodox approach to ministry. Number one, don't go where the people are, make them come to you. And should they come, don't provide seating, make them stand. Don't build a building, meet outside. There you go, Mike. No, Mike's not here. Tell Mike I said that. Number two, dress unattractively. Avoid the latest trends. Don't have your colors done. In fact, look weird on purpose. Number three, speak offensively. Insult your listeners and verbally assault your opponents. Use harsh, condemning words. Call your detractors names like snakes in the grass and hypocrites. Number four, rail against high-ranking officials, officials who don't have integrity. Point out their lies and expose their double standards publicly. Don't hedge your words. Expose their sin and call them sinners. Number five, encourage your followers to follow a more worthy leader. In fact, admit your utter unworthiness by comparison. Listen, this, this was John the Baptist's unusual approach to ministry. He was different than anybody else. In fact, he may have been, in well, the way we would put it today, the most politically incorrect Christian leader who has ever lived. Frankly, I love the guy. I think he's great. <laughs> And yet, as someone put it, he broke every ministry building rule, yet he enjoyed incredible success. But what's most important about John the Baptist is that with all of his strange, view, his strange ways of looking at things, not strange views, his strange ways of looking at things and eating and dressing and ministering, Jesus referred to this man as the greatest man who has ever lived. He said that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now think about that. What a statement. Jesus said that John, this man who ate wild honey and locusts, John was greater than every notable character mentioned in the Old Testament. That means he was greater, Jesus considered him greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than Samuel, greater than Daniel, greater than King David. Of all the outstanding men of God who have lived in ancient times, Jesus said that this man, John the Baptist, was the greatest. And this morning, it's our privilege to look at this great man because today our study in Luke has brought us to the opening section of chapter 3, which is about, as you know, the beginning of John's ministry. As I've already mentioned, the reason that Luke does this, the reason he explains to us the ministry of John, is simply because it sets the stage for what is most important to Luke, and that is to tell us about the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus, which is exactly what Luke will do, and we'll see that when we get to the second part of chapter 3. So with this as our background, here's what Luke tells us about John and his ministry. Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. We'll not be able to cover all of these verses today, but this is the big picture. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene in the high priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight. The rough roads smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation 
of God. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, Oh, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you've been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Now, as you can see, there's a great deal of information given by Luke here about John's ministry. He mentions prominent Roman government leaders, a couple of Jewish high priests. He tells us that the work that John did among the people was a baptism called the baptism of repentance. He gives an Old Testament prophecy that predicted, it verifies, it clarifies the coming and the purpose of John and his ministry. Luke even tells us about what John said to the crowds of people who flocked to hear him and be baptized by him. But though I realize there is a lot of information in this passage, this information about John and his ministry is presented to us in really a very logical fashion in five easy-to-follow headings. And what these headings do is they put before us five key truths about the ministry of John. And we're going to look at four of these truths today, and Lord willing, next week we'll look at the fifth one. The first of these key truths about John the Baptist's ministry that Luke tells us about is this. Number one, he tells us about the time when John began his ministry. Starting at verse 1, we read, Now in the 15th reign... Uh, a year, rather, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene in the high priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas. Now, Luke tells us about the start of John's ministry by mentioning seven historical figures that were prominent at the time. And their prominence is only in terms of their relationship to the nation of Israel. With the first five being Gentile political figures and the last two being Jewish religious figures. And Luke's purpose in mentioning these men is simply to establish the historical context and the date for when God called John to begin his ministry. And to accomplish this, Luke states that John entered his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, who was the ruler of the Roman Empire. Now, Bible scholars are divided over what year constituted the 15th year of Tiberius' reign. And they, they're, they're divided because for a few years prior to the, to the death of the previous emperor, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius ruled with him as his co-regent. So is Luke dating it from that time when he reigned with the other Caesar or when he reigned alone? And that's why scholars are divided. However, when you read through all of the literature, it seems that the year AD 26 harmonizes best with other events that we read about in the New Testament. And so it would appear that what Luke is telling us is that John began his ministry in AD 26, which means that Jesus also began his ministry sometime during that year too, just a little bit later, a few months later. Luke also tells us that at the time John started ministering, the infamous Pontius Pilate, the Roman official who three years later would sentence sentence Jesus to be crucified, he was at that time governor of Judea. 
In addition, Luke tells us about some other local political figures who under Rome's authority were ruling regions of Israel at the time. No one ruled the whole place, just various regions. In fact, that's why he uses the term tetrarch. A tetrarch means a ruler of a fourth part of a province. Luke says that Herod was tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis. And a man by the name of Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene. Now, the Herod mentioned here is none other than Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great. And he is the Herod who ruled the region of Galilee during the ministry of Jesus, as well as the man who put John the Baptist to death. His brother Philip, another son of Herod the Great, ruled a different region of Israel, the region in the north where the town of Caesarea Philippi, named after the the emperor as well as himself, is located. Some of you who have been there, if you've been to Israel, it's near the modern country of uh, Lebanon now. Third ruler mentioned by Luke is a man by the name of Licinius, who really, frankly, we know very little about, simply that he ruled over an area known as Abilene, which was located northwest of Damascus. Adding then further to the historical framework for when John began his ministry, Luke tells us, he tells us at the start of verse 2, that while the five Gentile men previously mentioned were ruling politically, over Israel, two Jewish men were ruling spiritually over the nation as high priests, their names being Anas and Caiaphas. Now, Israel only had one high priest at a time, so the question is, why are two men then mentioned here as high priests? Well, the answer is that Anas had been removed from the office of high priest by the Roman government and replaced by his son-in-law, Caiaphas. However, though Caiaphas was now technically the high priest, the Jewish people upset at the Romans for interfering in their religious affairs, they still looked upon Anas as their high priest and treated him as such. So in reality, there were two high priests ruling over the nation at the time when John began his ministry. One who was considered the real high priest by the Jewish people, the other who was the official high priest recognized by the Roman government. Both of these men were evil, they were wicked, they were corrupt, and both of them would be involved in the crooked trial of Jesus before the leading council of Israel, the Sanhedrin. Now, while Luke's primary purpose, as I told you, in mentioning these seven leading figures is to establish the starting time for John's ministry, it's also true that these men were politically and spiritually very dark figures. And it's against the background of this darkness that Luke proceeds to tell us about John the Baptist, whose role was to announce to Israel that their Messiah, the light of the world, was about to arrive. And the way Luke does this is by giving us then a second key truth about John's ministry as he moves from telling us about the time when John began his ministry to number two, the call of John to begin his ministry. So we read in the middle of verse two, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. Now with these brief words, Luke tells us that God's word came to Zacharias' son, John, while he was living in the wilderness. And what that means is that just like the prophets of old who ministered during Old Testament times, God spoke directly to John. He did not read this in the Bible. John spoke directly to, uh, God spoke rather directly to John as one of his prophets, telling him to leave the wilderness and to begin his public ministry as the forerunner of the Messiah. This is what John was born to do, and now was the time God was telling him to do it. And what this tells us is not only that John was a prophet sent by God, but also that he was the first prophetic voice to speak to the nation of Israel in over 400 years since the close of the Old Testament era. Now, 
Luke, notice, he's careful to point out that it was while John was in the wilderness that this divine call came. So a very natural question for those of us who read this is to ask really two questions related to each other. What wilderness is this and why was John living there? Well, first of all, I remind you that we have already been told that John would live in the wilderness. We were told this back in chapter 1, verse 80, Luke said this concerning John the Baptist, and the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance in Israel. Now, this desert is not, is not what you would ordinarily think of a desert. It's not one of mounds and mounds of rolling sand. Rather, this is an area in Israel known as the Judean wilderness. It's a very desolate place, a very remote place. It is a rugged area along the western shores of the Dead Sea. Those of you who have been to Israel will know this as the area of Qumran and um, where Masada is. It's just a remote, desolate, rocky area. One Bible teacher described this wilderness as, and I quote, that piece of real estate where nothing grows except a few scrub brushes, bushes rather, here and there, where the land is covered not with sand, but by pebbles and stones and rocks under which live scorpions and snakes. So then, why, we might ask, was John living in such a remote, desolate place? Well, the answer is, I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Scripture is silent. However, we can speculate. And we speculate that with his parents being advanced in years when he was born, it's very likely that John was orphaned at a young age. And for whatever reason, we have not been told, he decided to move to the wilderness. But what we do know is that the area certainly fit John's character as, as a rugged, tough, weathered, individual, as opposed to those who, who lived in relative ease in Jerusalem and perhaps some other well-developed towns and cities in Israel. In fact, Jesus spoke of John's robust character when he said these words about him in Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 8. This is just before he said that John was the greatest man who's ever lived. Here's what Jesus said. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. Jesus said that John was anything but weak, vacillating, soft. And the wilderness he lived in, folks, it definitely fit his character. So having told us about the time when John began his ministry and God's call to John to leave the wilderness to begin his ministry, Luke moves on to tell us a third and really the most critical key truth about the ministry of John, and that is, number three, the message of John's ministry. That is to say, what did he preach? What was his message? Verse three says, and he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, having been told by God that the time had come for him to leave the wilderness, we now read that John moved into another area in Israel, the district in and around the Jordan River. And there he began preaching what Luke calls a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what exactly does this mean? What exactly was John's message that he preached? Was he telling people that they needed to be baptized in water in order to have their sins forgiven. Well, I want you to know there are some pastors today who think that that was John's message because that's what they believe, and they teach their congregations that baptism washes away their sins. But that wasn't John's message because nowhere, and I mean nowhere, is that ever taught in Scripture. Scripture clearly teaches that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, apart from anything that we could ever do. And that includes the work of being baptized. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 could not put it any clearer. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. But if John didn't preach that baptism was necessary for the forgiveness of sins, and he didn't preach that, then what did he preach? Listen very carefully. John's message was that repentance, not baptism, repentance was necessary for the forgiveness of sins, and then those who had repented, he would baptize as a symbol of the cleansing forgiveness that they had already received from God. Now, folks, this is a critical, critical truth. Critical because to miss this truth about repentance is to jeopardize your eternal destiny. And there are many who've done this. And consequently, they are in danger of being deceived into thinking that they're saved when in reality they're not saved. So it's very important that all of us understand this issue of repentance. First of all, The Bible makes it clear that repentance is required of all who would be saved from God's wrath by being forgiven of their sins. It is required. This is precisely the message of salvation that Jesus told his disciples to preach just before he left them and ascended back to glory to be with the Father. This is what our Lord told them, that they should be preaching and that we should be preaching. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus said that we preach a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what we are to preach. That's our message. Secondly, if repentance is necessary for us to experience the forgiveness of our sins, then it is essential, absolutely essential, that we understand exactly what it means to repent. So listen closely, because your eternal destiny really is at stake. You've got to get this. Repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart, that leads to a complete turnaround in your life where you feel so bad about your sin that you are determined to break with whatever evil you are presently doing or have done in the past and to follow Jesus in humble submission to his lordship over your life. Let me say that again. Repentance is a change of mind and heart that leads to a complete turnaround in your life where you feel so bad about your sin that you are determined to break with whatever evil you are doing now or have done in the past and to follow Jesus in humble submission to his lordship over your life. In other words, repentance is turning from your sin and turning to Christ for his salvation. This is exactly how Paul described what took place in the lives of the pagan Thessalonians when they were saved. This is what Paul wrote to them in 1 Thessalonians 1.9. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and a true God. So these pagan people turned away from their idolatry and they turned to God for salvation. That's repentance. Turning away from sin, turning to God for salvation. This turning from sin, that is exactly how Paul described his ministry before King Agrippa when in explaining to the king the message that Jesus had commissioned him to preach, he said these words in Acts 26, 18, that Jesus sent him, and I quote, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Now, Paul said his ministry, given by Jesus, is to turn people from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. There is a turning. That's repentance. And we know that this is repentance because right after saying this, immediately after he said this, in verses 19 and 20, Paul called it repentance. He said, so King Agrippa, I didn't prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Paul 
he described, he defined, he called, he referred to what he was telling people in turning from their sin. He called it repentance. That was his message of salvation to people. Now, folks, the reason that this issue of repentance is so critical for us to understand is because so often in our day, especially in American churches, there are men who proclaim Christ and call people to believe on him, but they fail to call people to repentance, like John the Baptist did, like Jesus did, like Paul did. In fact, some men even deny just outright deny that repentance is a part of the gospel message. And in doing this, then not only are they corrupting the gospel, but they're leading people astray so that many who think that they are saved, people who listen to them think that they're saved, in reality, they aren't. There, there's no fruit of repentance in their lives. They've never turned from their sin. Consider these important words by Dr. Kent Hughes. He writes, it's important for us to see the close connection between repentance and forgiveness because while no amount of repentance can ever merit forgiveness in the sight of God, without repentance, no soul will ever be saved. Repentance is the telltale mark of the grace of God at work in our lives. Saving faith and true repentance are always found together. Saved souls are repentant souls. He writes, this truth has an immensely practical implication. If you think that you are saved but do not have a repentant spirit, you are perhaps not saved at all. If there are sins of which you refuse to repent, and in fact, if truth be known, are becoming more and more comfortable with, it's possible that you are not a child of God. Then he clarifies with these words. I'm not referring to a person who's struggling with sin and often losing, but, but really desires victory, but rather to the person who has no desire to repent. Scripture and my own experience have taught me that an ongoing spirit of repentance, repenting not only of overt sins, but of unbelief, negative attitudes, self-centeredness, moral omissions, is not only a sign of salvation, but is a necessity for spiritual health. Those are, those are great words from Kent Hughes. Now, in case at this point you're a bit confused because you've always been taught that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and now I come along and I tell you that salvation is by repentance in Christ, let me assure you that there is nothing to be confused about because both are correct since repentance and faith always go together. They're like two sides of the same coin. As one theologian so succinctly put it, he said, saving repentance never exists except in partnership with faith. It is impossible, he writes, to have true faith in Jesus Christ apart from true repentance from sin or true repentance from sin apart from true faith. So the message that John the Baptist preached to those who gathered to hear him in the region of the Jordan River is that they needed to turn from their sin and turn to God in order to receive divine forgiveness from him. And those who did this, those who did repent after hearing John, he then baptized in the Jordan River as a symbolic sign that they had repented and had been cleansed by God forgiving them. Now, what's so fascinating about this is that prior to John the Baptist, Jewish people were never baptized. You may have never heard that before, but it's true. Jewish people were never baptized. While Judaism certainly practiced various ceremonial washings, in fact, they, they still do, no Jewish person was ever required, based on Judaism, to be baptized. However, Jewish people did require that Gentiles undergo the rite of baptism if a Gentile wanted to convert to Judaism. And the reason that Jews imposed baptism on a Gentile proselyte was because in their minds, Gentiles were morally unclean and needed to be ritually, symbolically cleansed by the waters of their baptism. So think about, think about this. Think about what John was doing in preaching to Jewish people his message of repentance and then baptizing them. Put yourself in their place. In essence, 
John was telling these folks that they were no better than morally filthy Gentiles and that if they wanted to be saved, then they needed to admit that they were just as wicked, just as evil as the very pagans that they despised and looked down upon. And they needed then to turn from their evil and to humble themselves by being baptized like an unclean Gentile. That was radical. See, folks, what John was doing was preparing, preparing the Jewish people for the coming of their Messiah, preparing their hearts. They were not ready, not ready at all. Contrary to what many people think, the Jewish people of that day were not godly. Now, there's always a remnant of godly Jewish people in every generation, but for the most part, the majority were not godly. They were rather entrenched in a suffocating kind of self-righteous religious legalism, a kind of piety that only emphasizes outward behavior instead of inner godly attitudes and motivations. <coughs> this, is, this is exactly what Jesus denounced in his Sermon on the Mount when he exposed the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and those who followed their phony pretense of being godly. Notice what our Lord said about the people of his day and how they tried to show off their pious acts of righteousness. It was not righteousness at all, but they did this, he said, for the approval of men. Our Lord gave a, a general statement in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 about this. He said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, he said, you have no reward with your Father who's in heaven. And then the Lord proceeded to give some very specific examples of how these folks practiced their righteousness in order to be noticed by others. He tells them, first of all, they did it when they gave money to the poor so that everybody could see them give. We read in verse 2. So when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you. Could you imagine they sounded a trumpet? Look at me. I'm giving to somebody. Jesus said, don't do it. Don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Meaning, they wanted, the, they wanted applause. They got it. They're not getting it from God. They got it. They've already gotten their reward. They also did this when they prayed so that everyone could see how devoted to God they were. Chapter 6, verse 5. When you pray, you're not... You're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. That's like us going out to, to US 19, stopping the traffic so we can have a prayer meeting. Look at me. That's exactly, in principle, what they were doing. They also did this when they fasted so that all could see how humble, how truly humble they were. Jesus said this in verses 17 and 18. But you, when you fast... Anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Don't let everybody know you're fasting. That's between you and God. Don't, don't try to show off how humble you are. Folks, all they did was solely for show. It was a religious performance. That's it. A performance so that others would be so impressed with how holy and committed to God they were, but it was pure theater. It was hypocrisy. Actors on a stage playing out roles that were foreign to their true character, and they did it just to impress others. That was the self-righteous spiritual condition of the majority of Jewish people at the time of John and Jesus. No wonder John's message was a call to repentance. Instead of pretending to be godly, they needed to denounce their efforts to merit salvation by their own, their own works, honestly face their sinful hypocrisy and turn from it and humbly admit that, that their hearts were, were wicked and evil and they were in rebellion towards God, not obedience to Him. And the reason John preached such a message of repentance is because his role as forerunner of the Messiah was to spiritually prepare the Jewish people for the arrival of Jesus. They were not prepared, not with that kind of religious hypocrisy. 
And that's exactly what Luke proceeds to tell us as he moves now to give us a fourth key truth about John the Baptist's ministry. Having already told us the time when John began his ministry and the call of God to begin his ministry and the message of his ministry, Luke now tells us the purpose of John's ministry. Notice verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, in stating these words, Luke is not only explaining the biblical basis for John's ministry being fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, but he's also stating the purpose of John's ministry in calling people to repentance. You see, about 700 years prior to this, prior to John's ministry, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, as recorded in the Old Testament book named after him, he wrote in chapter 40, verse 3, I read it to you earlier, the very words that Luke is now quoting. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now these words are a very specific prophecy that someday the Lord would come to the nation of Israel. And that someone referred to here as a voice in the wilderness will be crying out to the Jewish people to prepare a clear, straight path for the Lord's arrival so that there would be no obstacles, no debris, nothing hindering him as he entered. Now, what Luke is telling us is that John the Baptist, he is the fulfillment of this prophecy made 700 years earlier. He's the one who is that voice in the wilderness crying out to the people to prepare, note this, not the roads leading into Israel, but rather to prepare their lives, their hearts in anticipation of the Lord's arrival. And the way they were to do this, the way that they were to prepare for the Lord's coming was by repenting of their sins. Notice what the rest of this prophecy says, verses 5 and 6. Every ravine, every valley means will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Now the meaning of these words has to do with an ancient custom that when a prominent ruler was on his way to enter a city, he would send a messenger ahead of himself who would announce to the citizens of that city that they needed to prepare for the monarch's soon arrival by smoothing out the road leading into the city. And how were they to do this? Well, by filling in every valley, uh, by bringing all mountains and hills low, by making every crooked path straight, by making all the roads smooth and, and even. Now listen closely. What Luke is telling us isn't that John the Baptist was calling the people of Israel to make any geographical changes to the physical roads in preparation for Messiah's arrival, but rather they were to change their hearts in preparation for his arrival. In other words, they were to bring the mountains of their proud hearts low by humbling themselves. They were to straighten out their crooked and perverse hearts. They were to smooth out the sinful rough edges of their lives. And they were to, to do this by repenting in response to the preaching of John the Baptist, the voice who was crying out to them. See, this was the purpose of John's ministry, to prepare the Jewish people for the arrival of the Lord. And he did this by calling them to repent of their sin. I love the way that one teacher I read put it. He said, the Baptist was saying, mend not your roads, but your lives. To put it in terms of American geography, repentance removes the obstacles, flattens the Saharas, and fills in the death valleys in our lives so that Christ has full access. And if the people who heard John would repent, not only would they experience salvation, but eventually... All who, who would hear the gospel and respond in repentance, they also would experience salvation in Christ. That's exactly what verse 6 says. Notice, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Now, this, is, this statement specifically refers to the future millennial kingdom on earth. When all the earth, all the peoples living on this planet will see God's salvation in Christ. But it certainly has application for us, the application is this. 
If you have heard the gospel, if you have heard and seen the truth about Jesus Christ lived out before you by somebody, then come to Christ. Believe on him. Repent. Trust him for your salvation. Don't delay. You see, the primary question that comes out of our study this morning is this. Have you responded to the gospel by repenting of your sins? You see, so many people, as I said, who think they're saved have never really turned from a life of sin, meaning they've, they've never repented, which means they're not saved. They may have prayed a prayer of salvation, asking Jesus into their heart, into their life, or they may have come forward in a church service altar call because there was an emotional tug at their heart, but they have never really had a change of heart and mind concerning their sin that has led to a turnaround in their life. So if you have never repented of your sin, then I call you to do so today. Today, turn from what you know to characterize your life. Not what you're struggling with, but what characterizes your, your life. Self-centeredness, selfish ambition, anger, jealousy, pride, moral failures, hatred. And then turn to Christ, placing your confidence, your trust in Him alone for your salvation. If God has brought you today to that point in your life where you are willing, desirous to repent, and you would like to speak to one of our pastors about this, then just see me as we close the service. I'll be right up here, okay? And I ask our elders who are here to come forward and join me, and if someone comes up, we will turn to you for help, okay? Let's join our hearts for prayer. Father, we indeed thank you for what we've been able to study today. Lord, John was indeed a great man, just as you said, and we pray that we might see some of the greatness of this man, the boldness, the, the fearlessness he had, the lack of concern that anybody really liked him. He just wanted to be faithful to you, and Lord, I pray that his message of repentance preached so many years ago would ring loud in our hearts. I pray for anyone here or watching or listening who perhaps has never really repented, never really had a change of heart and mind and, and turned from their sin, I, and they think that they're saved. I pray that you will help them to see that they're not, and I pray that they will have the courage to indeed trust Christ no matter how old they are, no matter at what stage of life they are, no matter what position they might have in the church, but to turn from sin, to turn to Christ and be saved. That is your work in their hearts, not something we do. But we pray that this would be accomplished for your glory and honor. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.